Hello, hello, homebrew Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and this is a very special episode of Homebrewed Christianity because, well, it is sponsored. That's right, by Daydox Films. Daydox Films, and it's not spelled like Day Dash Docs, but it is spelled D E I D O X. And what is Daydox Film? It is a nonprofit ministry. It produces five minute documentaries to help pastors show what bodied, embodied, modeled Christian faith looks like. So a video kind of follows a person around for a week or two talking about the way their faith is embodied in their lives. Uh, over 1,500 different people, like ministry leaders, pastors have already used Daydox Films and Worship, or the small group setting, and it helps bring sermons alive, prompts discussions, and you can go and watch them all in their entirety over at the website at daydoxfilms.com, or daydox.com, but the thing is, daydox.com is D-E-I-D-O-X.com. That is D-E-I-D-O-X dot com. And as a Los Angelite, I suggest that you start with the story of Dion. He's a cop in downtown LA, and he brings God's love to the flock he's been given. And we mean that metaphorically. That given in light of all the tension and frustration between um, uh, the police and the public it has been going on, this is a wonderful place to start a conversation around all those tensions, be it with uh, uh, students or in a, in a sermon setting. So go check out the, the video of Dion. And uh, thank you, Daydox Films, for sponsoring the podcast. Now, let's get to this week's podcast. Homebrewed Christianity listeners, this podcast is going to be a little snippet, a little taste, a little lure, you could say. Why? Because honestly, last night, uh, Pete and I uh, did our first philosopher session of the high gravity class on Paul and the philosophers. This uh, high gravity classes, these are online streaming um, classes that Homebrew does, where if you want to take uh, the home brewing experience to the next level, you know, like, and you raise the gravity, the alcohol level, it's a metaphor. Um, then you take these classes and they're like more hardcore and nerdy than normal. Uh, in this high gravity class, uh, Peter Rollins and I are looking at political philosophers talking about Paul. Uh, last week, uh, Daniel Kirk came and talked Bible, and that set up then reading through uh, Jacob Talbus' uh, book, Political Theology of Paul. Then uh, Badu's book on Paul. We'll spend two weeks on that. Then two weeks on Zizak's book, um, uh, The Pup and the Dwarf, where he talks about Paul and the perverse core of Christianity. And uh, this week, since it was the first kind of normal session where we talk about a philosopher, uh, the first 35 minutes, 40 minutes or so, uh, Pete and I kind of discussed why we're interested in philosophers who happen to not even believe in God, why they're interested in Paul, and why we, in different conversations, be it the post-theist all the way to the minister, or have what do we have to benefit to gain from engaging in the conversation? So we thought that we would share this uh, like first third or whatnot of this session and say, listen to it, it's enjoyable, it's excitement, and when you listen to it, you say, I think I want to go join the class. Then you can. You can go on to homebrewedchristianity.com and click the link to um, the learning site, or you can just literally type in tripfuller.com slash learning. Don't go to tripfuller.com. Just go to tripfuller.com slash learning. Um, anyway, uh, then you can join the high gravity class and uh, have fun playing on the internet with us. If you uh, enjoy this type of thing, you can actually right now, we just added it, get uh, the last three classes that Pete and I did together um, in one little discount package. So I can sit up paying you know, like 30 bucks here, 30 bucks here, 30 bucks here. You can get three classes, our radical theology class, our Christology class, and our atheism for Lent class, all in one big package uh, for 50 bucks. And, you know, then you could just just be a nerd for hours upon end. Um, anyway, I uh, hope you enjoy this. Head over to the website. Let us know what you think about it. Share it with your friends. Get uh, and, and get the word out there. Um, and if you are going to be in Chicago next week, that March 18th of 2015 at the Progressive Youth Ministry event, which is sold out, um, you can decide that your life would be better off if you spent 
the 18th. That would be Wednesday, the day before it, with me and Scott Pape at a Theology Nerd Boot Camp. That's right. It's a one-day intensive, um, progressive theology workshop conversation soiree. If you have signed up for it, very soon you'll be getting an email of a couple articles to read on the plane. You don't have to, but uh, we'll be using them to talk about uh, a whole host of different progressive theological voices that are around today. Uh, and yes, I got a couple emails from people that said, hey, um, I, I want to go to a theology nerd boot camp, but um, I'm not going to be in Chicago. Well, if you want a theology nerd boot camp, then you can email me. And um, if you have someone that wants to host it, a place that wants to host it, or we want to put it together, and that kind of thing, we can figure it out. So if you're in a city and you want a theology nerd boot camp, then just email Trip and let Trip know. And I'll talk to Trip and say, hey, um, we should have a theology nerd boot camp in that city. Anyway. Uh, thank you for Daydox Films. Uh, enjoy this little snippet of one of our uh, philosophy sessions. And uh, everyone know Pete has a brand new book come out. Yeah, his brand new book. And uh, it's about the divine magician. And, and I disagree with Pete just violently. It's, I, I like to tell him regularly how wrong he is. But I said to him, this book, Pete, is your best book yet. That's what I'm saying. That doesn't mean, it, and I'm not saying he, I, I was persuaded. I'm still on team process, you know, but um, it is his best book, and you'll enjoy it, and you should get it. You should read it, um, because, you know, when, when Pete manages to do something good, then you should probably uh, support it. Otherwise, you're just going to keep getting all this other stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I love you too, Pete. All right. So um, here's a little snippet. Go to homebrewedchristianity.com. And uh, tweet the episode, share it on Facebook. When you're going to buy something on Amazon, click through the Amazon link because we get a kickback. And for those of you, whoever it was, that bought like 50 iPad protectors, thank you. I mean, they clicked through, bought 50 iPad protectors, and they spent, I have no idea, a lot of money. Because we got like 60 bucks for them buying all these iPad protectors through the Homebrew Christianity link. So if you have recently protected a large number of iPads and use the link, thank you. Um, so here it is, Paul and the Philosophers. Hi, my name's Trip, and I'm with my friend Pete. Hello, how's it going? Cool? And we're in a garage. Um, and this is week two of Paul High Gravity. This week we leave, um, you know, that Paul, all the people that read the New Testament professionally talk about. Yes. We're leaving him behind. Yep. Amen. I mean, he's in our heart somewhere <laughs> because uh, Daniel Kirk did a great job last week. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a, like a, a year of New Testament scholarship in three hours. Yep. So th uh, this week we start with uh, Talbus and... The political theology of Paul. Um, but what we're going to do is step one is Pete is going to talk about what we're about to do the next few times. Then we'll talk about some of the main ideas that the different thinkers explore. And then we will dig into some of our favorite parts about the text. Feel free on the conversation part, which will show up on my phone right over here, is just to post any questions, passages, topics. And then uh, we'll try to weave them into what we're saying. Have the book out near you because, um, you know, we'll read along. Yep. Sounds good and, to uh, me. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. I just want to start by, you know, saying a few words about why we are looking at three kind of basically atheist philosophers uh, when we're talking about Paul. Because you think of Paul as obviously theological. It's the theologians who are interested. Um, but... Uh, and in some ways, none of these theologians or none of these philosophers uh, take on Paul's central claim, which is, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. And, um, you know, the, uh, take, taking this as a, as a literal idea of the resurrection of the dead. Um, so how can they then have an interest in, in, in Paul's wider project? And I guess, I mean, one, one of the things I think about is how, uh, you know, when you fall in love with somebody, uh, there's a lot of contingency involved. You, you meet somebody randomly at a bar and you just, at the right time, the right conversation, there's just something that connects the two of you together. And that transforms your life. And you can't help but uh, 
find in that person who is just happens to be there. It could have been somebody else. You could have been growing up some other place in the world, but they were there at that moment and they become the, the concretization of your feelings. That's like, oh my goodness, they were there from the beginning. You, you read everything from your past as if it was what Kierkegaard says about Regina, like it was uh, some, some Old Testament prophecies uh, that were waiting for the incoming of this, this person, this person that you love. And everybody else around you kind of accepts that that person is the one that you love, but they don't love him or her, at least not in the same way that you do. But they might talk about how, oh my goodness, your life has been transformed from meeting this person. And this has opened up a whole new person. You know, you used to be an introvert, you never went out or whatever. And and now you are in love with the world. So this person has opened up something for you. And in a sense, I think this is a way of understanding the um, how a particular belief or a particular cause, something particular and contingent in the world can take on universal significance for us and it can uh, open up a different type of world. And so for a lot of these philosophers, I guess, they, they go, well, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in, well, one, the context that Paul's writing from, uh, yes, what he believes, but also what opens up for Paul, what kind of new community arises, what new horizons open in philosophy and in community and in politics as a result of Paul's commitments. Um, and in particular, this is important, and I think for Talbos this is important because, um, well, it's like Feuerbach, I, a philosopher I've always liked. Feuerbach you know, read Christianity as about, as about the earth, about the grime and the grit of the world, about anthropology, about turning uh, the bread and the wine of communion into real bread and real wine for people. And Feuerbach, by rereading Christianity in a very radical way, opened up the doors to people like Marx and Engels and others to um, engage in a very political type of philosophy and talk about how uh, we actually go about changing real circumstances in the world. And Talbot is doing something similar with his reading of Paul. Uh, Paul was very much under the shadow of kind of Lutheranism. Um, and, you know, Tripp will know a lot more about this than me, but, but, but in a sense, Luther read Paul as apolitical, as quietistic, as contemplative, about uh, uh, ad- advocating a, a quiet spirituality that, that allowed the rulers to rule. Um, and then, you know, it was about inner contemplation and inner salvation. And, and combined with that, uh, Luther also read Paul as critical of the Jewish law and, and in a sense then kind of as an anti-Semitic reading, uh, at least a reading of Paul that, that was critical of Judaism. And, you know, this is important because obviously, you know, Paul, who we might talk about this more, but can be seen as the, the founder of Christianity in a sense, the person who, who you know, bring, who is the apostle to Christ and who brings this message out and, and creates churches and communities out of this. Um, that, you know, this has influenced millions of people. And if it can be shown that this reading of Paul, uh, especially at this time, is not anti-Semitic, it's not anti-Jewish, um, and it's also not quietistic, it, it, it has something to say politically, well, you know, that's, that's, that could be transformative to the lives of, of millions of people. Or at the very least, it asks the question of um, who really... Um, who really is part of the legacy of Paul? Uh, who can claim that? Is it the church, the actual existing church, or is it like the political groups that are on the streets fighting for solidarity and transformation in, in, in real political, the real political arena, in the trade unions, for example? Um, so either the church has to change and we go, okay, actually, you know what? The church has to be a place of, of radical politics and, and, and not anti-Semitic. Um, or what we'll discover is that there, there are people out there who are more Christian than those who call themselves Christians, who actually are more uh, fighting for the type of community that Paul opens up and talks about than, than those who, who claim um, to be uh, in his wake. So yeah, so that's, this is Talbot. He's writing in the, in the aftermath of Paul in, in a time when, when Paul is, is seen, as I say, as critical of Jewish law, as open, as being quietistic and letting the rulers do their thing. And Talbot comes in and says, 
we got to read Paul from a Jewish perspective. Paul sees himself as as Jewish um, and, and, and very much is in that context. And two, the way Paul writes, uh, when he writes to, to the Romans, the, the Roman church, and when he talks about Jesus as Lord, uh, when he talks about Jesus as a son of God, uh, these are political statements um, that uh, challenge Roman rule um, and opens up the possibility of a new type of community that's founded on love, that fulfills the law, um, and also that um, unifies people who were previously separated. So there's there's the kind of context. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah. Um, so um, I guess one of the things that might be helpful, especially if this is the first time you've read a philosopher who is obsessed with parts of the Bible, right, is just to think about how philosophers throughout history have constantly read the Bible. Um, uh, this kind of turn, end of the 20th century into today, towards Paul, comes after philosophers kind of regularly coming up with ways of engaging in the big contemporary philosophical questions, engaging the dominant formative text of the West, mm. right? And we have essentially two big conversations. It's like Plato and company, and then Jews and Christians. Yeah. And what, in the 17th and 18th century, at the rise of the Enlightenment, philosophers there were taking the results of the historical Jesus— or uh, the teachings of Jesus, and they were using him as an example, um, uh, maybe the perfect example or best example of moral, universal law and ethics. Kant does it. John Locke does it. These founders of modernity, in a sense, the people that worked out democracy, nation, state, capitalism, and things, said that Jesus while we may not want to go on the whole resurrection thing, right? Like they want to do the same thing and like, I don't want to do this whole all orthodoxy, but Jesus is completely fascinating. Yeah. And so they make him the example. Yes. And just to echo that, I mean, th these are texts that you study because they have had such an impact. Like, it, you know, this is the reason why you look at these texts is somehow they have articulated um, something deep, in, in the culture, um, it expresses something deep. P millions of people resonate, or, or with Plato, like it's a huge influence in the whole turn to philosophy. So in a sense, you were reading these texts because they, they're, they're dynamic, they're incendiary, they're, they're alive. Mm -hmm. and, and so like if you think of that 17th and 18th century where philosophers got really into the synoptic gospels and teachings of Jesus, the 19th century was where philosophers got into the Gospel of John. All it takes is reading any of the German idealists to find out that the idea of how this uh, perfect mind logos principle of spirit becomes materialized and then in the materialization, material becomes spiritualized. That's like what Germans talked about for a century. It's what philosophers wrestled with. And if you were to sit down with Hegel and Schelling and go like, hey, let's have a Bible study. They're like, great, let's start with the Gospel of John. Yeah. And you saw energy developing there. So in the 20th century, when philosophers turned to Paul and the ones we're reading, the question that they're coming in isn't, how do we, at the emergence of modernity, articulate uh, a relationship that's new between kind of the political, economic, and religious spheres now that they're all kind of more autonomous? And it's not the German idealist one. How do we figure out how to narrate our story of human beings now that we see ourselves as part of this evolutionary process, this development of culture, let us return and give sacred meaning to the story with a Logos doctrine. Here, these philosophers are ones that are like post-postmodern. Mm. Like if you ask them what's the problem, what is so exciting about Paul, they were like, Paul at least believes something. And so I came up with a series of questions like these are the questions they never tell you they're necessarily asking that the three readers we're reading are asking when they turn to Paul. Can anyone believe one damn thing in a postmodern world? Why? Because, well, before you say anything, Pete, you should locate yourself. And after you locate yourself and before you ever talk about truth, you need to deflate every statement about truth you're about to have. Otherwise, we know it's a good question. Can truth be anything but an oppressive power grab? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we can't talk anymore. And uh, does truth exist outside a legitimating dialogue of the one? Yeah. This top-down, 
oneness, and you should capitalize it because it's super oppressive. Um, so, so like they take take uh, something that, that these idealists and 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 in the the founders of enlightenment come up with like human rights. Sounds great. Then you think of female circumcision, and what happens? Well, like, do we want to imperialize them with our Western values and tell them from our culture that's mutilation and and just a violent, horrible act? Or do we want to try to understand it from this different culture? Mm-hmm. So it problematizes even something like that. Or uh, one of our friends that was here last week after the discussion told a story where he works with people in uh, in Africa and um, with a whole group of people with uh, HIV AIDS and creating small businesses for women and a number of the younger ones that are a part of this uh, kind of like intentional-ish community want to c- become doctors. They've made this clear. So this the Western person who's in it is explaining study habits like reading, studying, so you succeed at school. Uh, he was talking about it with – kind of enlightened postmodern Christian friends, and they said, you know, you should really think whether or not you're oppressing them by imposing these colonial notions of success. The only thing is, um, you probably want a doctor (laughs) that has learned to read and memorize what is necessary and then to think critically using variables and all that, right? So he got this pushback, like, oh, don't imperialize. But then you want to go like, no, I mean, amoxicillin... Yeah. works it's we better want than a dentist the doc yeah, it's yeah. Like killing a doc yeah. right so <laughs> like i say that because what it is when they're obsessed with this militant for truth paul like he's like i got one thing i know mm-hmm. this junk is true and the rest of the universe can go ahead and get in line yeah and um while we may go and think as christians why should we care what a what an atheist philosopher thinks about paul if you're a liberal protestant then it might be helpful for you to think about the fact there's someone in the Bible who at least believes something. Yeah. Because you could uh, Jesus seminar, Jesus out the building. You can uh, Constantinian compromise all of church history out the out the building. Yeah. And then Paul is like, don't even try to postmodern me. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, and so it matters in all these different spheres of religion, politics, ethics. Yeah. But I think what they're so attracted to is that yes. Paul's like, I got something I believe – and um, how do you yeah. feel about it? This is, uh, you know, you'll notice if you read continental political philosophy, you, there are those who are into reform, reforming, and then there's these philosophers who are kind of like into apocalypse and apocalyptic, something that breaks into the world and changes the, the, the entire constellation of beliefs. And, you know, in truth, sometimes Badiou and Shizek come, you know, they're extreme apocalyptic thinkers in many ways. But the reason why they like Paul is they're concerned with this this idea of reform. Well, you know, we can't do anything big. We make little changes. We, you know, trip saying we can't respect others and, and make little piecemeal transformations. But for a lot of these thinkers, what happens then is you're actually creating change within a system that is inherently oppressive and problematic and so for someone like paul it's like he just comes in and 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 says something radically new he's a militant for a truth event for like that that is in absolute opposition to caesar it's not engaging with caesar and saying well you know let's have a little bit of this or a bit of that he comes in says there's a new king in town and this is a king of weakness not of power of of foolishness not wisdom and uh, yeah so this this is a the, the, this is why it's post postmodern. It's like it's back to a truth event. Yeah, and and there's a number of ways. And, I, and I'm only harping on this because I can imagine people that had could sign up the class that didn't know. They just seen a Zizek video and thought, well, Trip and Pete might have fun talking about Paul and Zizek videos. Mm. But like, why I think this question matters for people that are post Christian that aren't sure where they fit and are those that are completely at home in a church and you do the Eucharist and baptism like me. Like, But all of us live in a world where we wonder whether or not anyone can imagine a universe that's not structured by nation-state capitalism or nation-states and global capitalism. And we know if you just are slightly observant that the structures that already exist and reign don't care about the longevity of our planet, our ecosystem. It doesn't care 
about who is excluded from um, uh, valuing, excluded from the set. That's all. But Badu would talk about it. Like, we, and so the this question is one where what would it mean if the people had no interest in the gospel or the ones that point us as Christians back to the fact that Paul insisted the gospel had no interest in fine-tuning us for the world that's already here. But in Paul's insistence about the to come, the will be, or the truth, or whatever, the event, whatever way we want to talk about it, it is a militant freeing from the inscription of power on our identity for the present. Because what is it? He God makes us a subject. That's an idea um, that, as opposed to, right, what does it mean to be human? You ask that as if there's some generic human thing around. What do these people want? They want to go, no, the event happens, and you're fractured, you're ruptured, you're split. And in being split, you have the possibility of becoming human, mm-hmm. of being grasped, taken up, uncovered, uh, revealed, whatever the phrase is. But they are philosophers that go, no, actually most of us don't have any clue what it would be like to be human. Yeah. Now, we're, we have all the body parts and the language and the relationships, but maybe on occasion we occasionally break through the malaise and have a little glimpse of life, but we've never had that whole shell of our reality just cracked. Yeah. And in doing so, the opening up gives the possibility of a genuine subject. Yes. And who had that articulates it better than anyone? Paul. Yes, this is a catastrophic uh, f- political philosophy, a, p- a philosophy of catastrophe. Um, and, and it's these guys are critical. And by the way, I, you should feel maybe when you're listening to Trip Talk, the kind of like almost the concern of this, because it almost sounds like a Stalin. It sounds like a, and, and that's, that's partly what they're trying to do is like go like, the, to make us tremble, almost like the way Kierkegaard makes us tremble in front of Abraham and Isaac, to make us tremble in front of Paul as, as this militant um, against small p politics. This is what a lot of these guys are critical of. When they say we need a new Paul, it's like small p politics is you know, how to be better in, in the workplace and, and, and how to do good things, like how to you know, a, a increase equality in the workplace, etc. But this all happens within an ideological system that these guys are critical of. They're, they're talking about a return to big P politics, uh, to, to something that, that breaks into what we're doing with a radically different way of, of, of contextualizing and constructing our economic realities. Yeah, it's like uh, if you're at the business meeting uh, for your nonprofit church or, or a group and, and someone, go, someone gets up, gives an impassioned plea, and the response is, uh, well, according to Robert's Rules of Order, I feel like we have to vote on the previous motion before we can take this one up. And instead of anyone responding to anything you say, they look, yeah, well, yeah, well, we got to follow Robert's rules of order here. It's nice, Paul. Um, So let's go. Like they're, they, they want something that's not like fine tuning what's there. Like uh, what's the, what's the Dr. Seuss book? Uh, The Lorax, right? Like they're, they, they build this plant in the truffula trees and they're making truffula shirts and if you the answer to the problem isn't fine tuning the factory because the better the factory is the more efficient it is it may you know get rid of some labor because it automates things and it's bad for those few people's jobs yeah. but in the big picture the more efficient they are the more destructive it is to the entire ecosystem that's there yeah. so if you're fine tuning a machine that makes turds you're mm-hmm. only figuring out how to feel better about things and exist in a machine that makes turds and the politic question with a capital piece like um so the way that what comes out of here stinks so why let's pick it let's build something different yeah and this this means like um and we'll probably come into this some of your other questions but um an example is like well with the jew and gentile thing with paul it's like that's a distinction that you couldn't have seen it like in a piecemeal way some bringing together of jew and gentile the new political event breaks down distinctions that we think are just impossible to break down. If someone says, well, you can't really have equality between male and female, you know, it's going to take years to do that. And we have to wait and see. And let's, let's take the long haul here. And it's like, no, you, you enact a, a, a truth event that just breaks down distinctions that we think are pretty much eternal. And, and it just, it just wipes the slate clean and says, there's a new way of doing things. 
That's mm. the that's a, a qualitative transformation, not minor quantitative differences. Yeah. So I there there are five little themes that come up in all three of the thinkers recover. And yeah. I have no idea if Pete's going to think these are good, but I came up with them, and then we'll we'll dig into Talbus just because it might be a helpful reference when reading yeah. the next one. Okay, we know what Talbus did with this. How does a Badu appropriate it? What does he do different? Yeah. So one we've talked about it is an obsession with the intensity of Paul's um, insistence upon the truth, and the way they will phrase it is that his intensity uh, in this singular thing, this singularity, this a truth event. It enables him to become a true universalist, but not a universalist in the modern sense where you have a giant system and everything fits within it. Now you know how each particular fits in your general structure of truth. It's There's a singular, and this single thing recasts all the rest of existence into a whole new universal system. Now the second one is there's the contrast between general particular relationship when it comes to truth and the singular universal and one of the ones that is a good example that, that Pete uses a lot and um, is the way identity politics works, right? Like um, uh, you, uh, you're you trying to be super inclusive. So you're like, well, my church is open and affirming now. We have the gays and the lesbians <sighs> feel liberal. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, but you thought about transgendered. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. Okay, yes, that particular is now accepted to the general structure of our awesome church. And they're like, well, what about uh, queer people? Well, what's the difference? Yeah. No, well, and you try to explain it. All right, and you can keep going through the alphabet, yeah. and these particulars are either affirmed or not affirmed in relationship to a general structure, but their identity either way is in relationship to the general structure. And what um, these philosophers are pointing out is that when truth is uh, defined as uh, accepting or including things postmodern people love, uh, certain things, then what you're doing when you're being progressive is you're making little outposts of truth advocacy. You're like, I advocate for one type of workers' rights or one type of inclusion or one type of this. But you win when your group finally is legitimated to the system. Yep. Now, what if... The legitimation of, let's say, uh, rice workers in uh, Arkansas ends up putting twice as many people who are already near poverty without subsidizing their crops in other countries because it's not available out of business. They lose their land. A multinational company, mostly run by Americans, then buys all their land, uh, industrializes it, Mm. and then hires one-third of the people to run the land they used to own. Like we would have felt successful, right, as American union workers for rice right r- rice farmers, but when we just won that one little battle, the general structure is like, all right, well, yeah, boom, yeah. and I when what they're rejecting is that, yes, absolutely, I think, and an example which I think uh, um, connects with what you're saying is. If you take the church today with, uh, you know, uh, homosexuality and the, the, a lot of the church, yeah, even within the evangelical tradition now is opening its doors to people who are gay and lesbian. But what, what you'll often see implicitly uh, is that that means that, you know, you can be part of the church as long as you are monogamous, one partner for life, right? Now, so in one sense, as, as Tripp's saying, you're, you're, this excluded group is now included In one sense, you're domesticating a a group. Of course, lots of people who are gay and lesbian want monogamous relationships, but there's there's lots of people out there who are straight and gay and who who have other relationship configurations. And that's not even anywhere on, I think, on the actual existing church's radar. But, um, you know, there's there's definitely lots of communities that have been excluded from kind of monogamous, ritualistic marriage um, and have found other ways to do relationships. And, And by kind of inviting people in, you kind of actually take away maybe some of the radicality of those communities and what they can teach us, how Mm -hmm. they can break the the ideological system we're in. So instead of saying, you can be now part of us and our our scene, we should maybe be asking, actually, what can can I, as as a straight guy who's kind of within this kind of certain set of values about relationships what can i learn about people who are outside of that community um that that might break open uh my ideological structure yeah and just like accepting a new particular 
for the free market creates a whole new market of people to market to and sell to. Yeah. So too in the church, this is I it took me a while to pinpoint why it was so depressing to me every time some famous evangelical it explains how evangelicals can like gay people now. Um they aren't advi- they aren't suggesting any actual changes to the church. And they'll even say it like this isn't affecting the gospel. Yeah. So what we're trying to tell you church is that now those gay people who used to make jokes about we can let them come to our church, and they too can go down the Roman road. Yeah. Right? Like, the what they're selling hasn't changed at all, yeah. but they now have a new market. Yeah. And it's uh, it, it's men that can sing well in their choir. Yes. I, like, I, knew, I have a friend who almost um, got disinvited to um, a community, a gay and lesbian community, because um, he didn't affirm the at- atonement. You know, so what was interesting, and it was kind of cool, actually, but in a sense of saying, well, there's conservative gay and lesbian churches, whatever. But it's also kind of was a, was a kind of a bit crazy to think that that now this community have just adopted, um, in a sense, the, all of the conservative theology that that they were definitely excluded from in the past, but um, they they've kind of been welcomed in as long as they kind of play the game and 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 affirm. Um, a certain kind of view of atonement, uh, you know. So. Yeah, now the truth positively affirms you as opposed to condemning you. Yeah. Which, I mean, I'm all down for this. Is Neither one of us are saying anything that churches or government shouldn't recognize dignity in no, each no. person. What we're saying is that for Paul, the gospel has nothing to do with being open and affirming. Yeah. Well, right? and, yeah, and this is where Bill, I mean, Bill Hicks has a famous line where he says, I'm all for women being ministers. You know, it just means twice as many people not to listen to. Right. And I think the line is, is very clever. He's going like, yes, the church should be inclusive and should have people, women and men, gay and lesbian people, all transgender being able to participate. But, but with the very end of the line, which is that just means more people for me to ignore is kind of like, is saying, yeah, but now they're just part of the order that itself needs to be transformed. So it's great and it's good, but actually the more radical move is to transform the very order which people are being invited into. And, and by the way, I want to say one thing. is, I, I find some of this scary because, like Tripp's saying, like I affirm these particular uh, political gestures. We need to be working concretely on the ground. And sometimes you read these philosophers and... It feels like they're just waiting for the apocalypse. You know, they're waiting for a, a, a Pauline figure to come in and, and re-change everything. And, and I actually, I want to affirm the, the need for protests in Ferguson. I want to affirm the need for solidarity mm. a lot. The, but, but what these people are concerned with is, as I say, like that, uh, the Bill Hicks line is, okay, if we're inviting people into a system, but, but the system is itself the problem, then we need a figure who problematizes the very system itself. I, I sat down with a uh, lesbian couple and doing premarital counseling before doing uh, a service. And, you know, I don't remember. Sometime seven or eight years ago, I I changed the way I spoke throughout the marriage ceremony mm-hmm. so that I would have said the same thing at a lesbian service as a straight one or a gay uh, man or wh- whatever. Um, and so I was talking to them about it, and, and they said, no, I— we wanted, we've always wanted a traditional wedding. Could you just use the old language? Yeah. And I was like, um, now I've told, like, you know, right-wing religion people, I just, I can't do that. And I didn't sign wedding certificates for years because you didn't have access. Mm. And I would insisted upon using the same words. And they're like, no, I, you, I, you can read the a man leaves his father, woman, and yoke, like, marriage between a man and a woman bible verses like we don't care like uh, it it's not like anyone's going to think one of us is really a guy we both have five thousand dollar wedding dresses yeah and i i I was like oh i mean i guess like and and it it was like frustrating and then i thought that's all right so that's kind of cool like where they're they're not interested in just like fine tuning a system to get accepted they're like oh this is this is what i want and it was a it was a much more Assertive protest, yeah. and it, oh, it, it was a pro. You think it was a, that was a protest against, in a sense. Yeah, they were like, yeah. "Please don't accommodate us. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I want you to do what the church has always done. I just want it done for us." Yeah, yeah. Because w- w- what it made me think of is, well, one is that's what we all want. Like, I, 
I want to be accepted by whatever I'm being excluded I'll do, from. I'll do your wedding, Pete. Is that right, William? We're no. just looking for Just need to find so someone. <laughs> my email is trip.fuller at gmail. Yeah. And um, I Alicia can, and I will read through the applications. Yeah, I can make balloon animals. Yeah, you know, I don't know magic what else. Trick. Magic, yes, I can, two magic I have, tricks. I have two magic good. tricks. <laughs> Nothing sexual. Um, <clears throat> so, but... The idea is, of course, I want if I if I'm excluded, uh, if I was a woman, if I was transgender, or whatever, and I'm excluded from the system. Of course, I'm like I want to be included. That's completely natural and it's completely good. And but as Trip's saying, the, the problem is, as I say, new groups get accepted in, and then new scapegoats are created, new outsiders, nothing changes. And and simply what 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 these guys are talking about is going like right, Paul. The, Paul, the figure of Paul is a figure of someone who just comes in and, and, and basically is not changing the rules of the chess game, but overturning the tables. Yeah, it's like, ah, chess is boring. Yeah, I got a new game. Um, so I'm going to say the other three fast because yeah. that, this all is good, that energy... But this is important. Yeah, no, yeah. And, but the first half of Badoo next week yeah. is... Uh, you just wait till you read it. His snark is something that neither one of us could get away with about saying stuff oh, like that. Oh, I know, that. I know. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I know. It, it, Badu, Badu says things about Judith Butler that um, yeah. that just make my inner Claremont cry. <laughs> um, so uh, the third one is that truth is communicated as gospel. Truth is an event. And the, for both, for all three thinkers, truth is not platonic in the sense that truth is a notion and one if you were talking about their relationship to truth would tell a story of ascent that you slowly grow and evolve and come into more truth this is true about plato and aristotle this is true about aquinas it's true about augustine the mystics have their their layers or stories they're slowly ascending up a mountain and paul has absolutely no interest in any of this right truth is an event in contrast to it there's no theory of truth it's a testimony. You tell about the truth. You witness to its revealing, to its rupturing, to everyone. There's not a a group that has evolved and it's come up more than out. No, the truth comes to the foolish and the wise. And in fact, if you're wise, you might not even recognize yeah. the truth is truth. Um, There's not a story because of it's sent. Because it's foolishness to the wise. It's yeah. thing. It, for, for you here is in the system, which is, so you you know, oh, there's a great sketch that Mitchell and Webb have where a guy has a job interview. And he, he says, well, we need someone who has creative you ideas. Do a story for each Mitchell and Webb YouTube video? I, I know. I want to I write that book. I want to write a I've never seen it. I've never watched one. And you've, I mean, it might be because we live together, but you've mentioned enough of them that I turned on the YouTube. Uh, and every one I was like, ah. Oh. I don't remember what Pete said about this. <laughs> That's right. I would love to write a philosophy book about Mitchell and Webb, but he's, this guy's in an interview. How many do we have to sell in advance? Well, yeah, more than my others combined. Um, he's sitting in a job interview. Um, he's like got very talented, all of that. But then he says, listen, I, I actually don't have creative ideas. You're looking for someone who's got creative ideas. I, I just say what everybody thinks. And then he goes on to kind of give examples. And he just gives these examples of what everybody thinks, you know, like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, Christmas decorations up in October, this is terrible. You know, all, like just, a list of things that actually everybody parrots. That's wisdom in a sense. Wisdom is what are the things that we all share that we all know is just the way things are? The Das Mann. Yeah. Yes, yes. The they, you know, which is, you know, Heidegger talks about, it's whenever say scientists say, you know, as you if know what they say. You know what they say, yeah. You know, It's everyone and no one at the exact yeah. same time. When you say to a child, don't do that, you know, and the child's like, why not? They're watching, you know, whatever. I don't know if you say that to kids. <laughs> That's maybe a bit creepy. Well, but it's it all they. depends on if you have a magical leprechaun that rotates yeah. around the house every day. Yeah, I think that's anti Irish. I think you're trying to get me out. But he, he has a leprechaun that has a, yeah, different places in the house every day. The point being, um, if I had a point, the point being, Oh yeah, that then then whenever something comes in and ruptures the system, it's full. It's by definition foolishness because it doesn't fit within the frame. It's what breaks the frame. So anyway, I was the, just wanted to say that that in a sense, the new is always foolishness, and that's why Paul talks about you know the foolishness of God is you know better than the wisdom of people and a stumbling block and all of that. So the um, it, I get the other part of it is like Paul doesn't show up and try to persuade anyone about anything. He yeah. comes in, he presents it, he doesn't force it on others, there's no coercion, there's no, un like, like, universalism for him isn't something you subject people to. 
It makes you into a subject. So what is the gospel proclaimer, witnesser doing? But it makes interesting existence where it is, it, or it or it reveals reality as disturbed where you thought it was mundane. It opens you up to things you weren't aware of, that the gospel, it's like a good sermon. I mean, people have had where you've had sermons, you've watched a YouTube video of comedians, or you've watched a movie, and you got out, and you then asked questions you'd never asked before. And the gospel is not interested in truth like that where it calls upon you and calls out of you, not justifies to you, explains to you. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the fourth is that the relationship between new, old is not like past, present, future in this linear understanding of reality that now like the new is right here and then the old's right here and it kind of just moves along, that the new, old is a retrospective identification of existence in the wake of the event. So if an event happened right now to Pete, he's like, now I have a completely different understanding of Trip and I's relationship. This rupture's happened. This was our old way we related. Now there's this new one. Now that uh, whatever thing's about to happen that ruptures us, Pete. Wow. <laughs> but um, you only identify the old in light of the fact the new arrived. You weren't expecting it. And and you see Talbus talks about the Messiah as precisely the not messianic expectation is what can make him a real Messiah. But the new happens and the new arrives and you go, Oh, that's the old, but like you never talk about your old car when you're in it yep. as my old car, you get a new one and, and you're like, your old Oh, car. that's my old car. That's you don't ever look at your girlfriend in, in high school and you're like, it's my old girlfriend. Mm, yes. That's not what you tell them. I said, you know, we're not going to get married. So at some point you break up, that's how you end the relationship. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a retrospective one. Yeah, you and don't so, say this is my first marriage. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's it's bad. You know, you say this is my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so so that those like it's not a transition progression over linear time. Truth happens to you, and then it re- reverses. And and the last one is um, that Paul makes us ask the question: How do you become a human subject? And Paul became subject through the resurrection or the encounter of the resurrected Christ. Um, and what they are looking at, the philosophers are trying to find out, does anyone articulate what it means to be a genuine human subject and not the ever ready stand in for Dasman or yeah. the person who, for Heidegger who never has authentic existence? That's or, yeah, that was because I was about to say, like, no, we need to maybe unpack what it means to become a human subject because, in a sense, you know, are we not all human subjects? And, the way I understand it, and I think this is what you're saying, is going back to that Mitchell and Webb thing, is that guy is able to pirate all of the wisdom of the day, no creative thoughts, just throws out what every kind of liberal kind of 30-something kind of would say at a, at a dinner party, at a cocktail party. Um, and, and so in a sense, he's, he's, he's part of Dasma, the they, He's, he's not representing some sort of singularity. And so when I read these people about saying becoming a subject, I guess it's kind of like a Kierkegaardian kind of, you're, you're pulled out of the, that kind of system um, and, and momentarily uh, are caught up in a, in, like would you say like in a different way of being and like uh, a free thinking is, I don't know if you can say authenticity. That's maybe how Heidegger would talk about it. But it sounds quite old fashioned. Like, well, how would you describe well, what Paul means by subject or what the Jew means by subject? Maybe the best is like to think what did Plato mean by becoming human? Uh, right. It was a gradation. You weren't like a, there was the form of human, which is this perfect thing. And when you become human, your soul is no longer determined by the particular con- contingent realities there you're free now to contemplate the one again and you return to the world of forms in this kind of like neo-platonic notion of spiritual ascent um as opposed to like there's a seed and it grows over time there's a baby it's conceived in birth and grows and matures paul sees that becoming a subject is not a native thing Mm -hmm. right like paul doesn't go hi friends did you know that you have the spark of infinity in you, that deep down the eternal is bubbling. I want to write this kind of book. This kind of book sells. It does sell. Right now? Yeah. Um, you know who would be in the room with us if we wrote that one? It would not be my fridge. Okay. 
It would be a no process book. And then, yeah. um, but, but Paul's sitting there going, so here's the thing. Uh, you have no idea that you don't really exist right now. Hmm. You only recognize the fact that you had a completely mundane, light, vain existence after God, you accomplished something, or you meditated in the right place or whatnot. It was like Jesus put you in the nutcracker and cracked you. And then you're like, oh, there's protein in me. Right. <laughs> and now I can be something good and have my nuts roasted by an open fire. Yeah. Like the uh, rupture makes you a subject precisely by splitting you. Yeah. So uh, the second half of Badoo, we talk about it. And then Zizek loves this part of Badoo, which isn't a huge part of his, picks up on it. We talk about it even more. Um, but what uh, Tobis does today is actually to look at what does faith, messianic faith looks like is precisely by having faith in something where that which is absurd to any other person is the place in which truth happens. So it happens to you, it comes upon you, it splits you, it ruptures you, and it's in the rupturing you can become a genuine subject. What does that mean? It means you're freed from all of the powers, silent and ununderstood, unconscious and aware of the they. And the they could be your parents. It could be the religious institution and guilt that acts upon you. It could be, depending on if you're a straight white guy, we have different threats of pol police violence. If you're an African-American man in L.A., you have very different they's. Hey, but there are so many powers in scripting our being all the time that Paul thinks you're in the grips of sin, law, death. Yeah. Now, what is it that could bring us out of sin, law, death? This inscription that determines our being. It's not a nice little evolutionary moment of contemplative silence. Yeah. It's not practicing the presence of God. Yeah. It's getting cracked, getting yeah. ruptured. And it's like... Uh you know, I think about it, you know, in terms of uh, where I'm from, Northern Ireland, that sectarianism was in the air, uh, maybe like racism is in the air in, in the US or whatever. And so even if you weren't sectarian and, you, you know, you believe Catholics and Protestants were equal, et cetera, et cetera, you still, it affected where you went to drink, uh, what schools you would send your children to, where you would buy a house. It, it still structured your your being it was the principalities and powers it didn't exist it insisted it was there as a presence even though you didn't in, affirm it in your mind but in a sense th there's a moment where some people and they're they're the crazy people or they're, they're the mad people um just that all of that means nothing they they are the ones who go to the bar that they're not supposed to, and that's dangerous. Sometimes they're the one who buys a house in 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 the estate that they shouldn't buy a house, and they just do it. They're no they're no longer constrained, um, and and those people are crazy and mad and often get killed, but they're also the instigators often of of, of radically new ways of being. Well, that that story actually made me think of something. The other day, I was talking to um, one of the people that work at Monkish. Uh, which is the best brewery in Torrance, California. Well, actually, just my favorite ever, but the one that's closest I go to the most often, the live events there and stuff like that. Um, and uh, Henry, the head brewer, PhD in feminist criticism in the New Testament and wonderful person, delicious beer. He, he when people are there, if you ever like listen to the music he picks, mm. it is not what you would think of as craft beer music. It's like, um, straight out of Compton, old school rap. Like it's, yeah. it is not music you think of as like pudgy bearded guys that drink crap beer. Yeah. Um, and so I made a joke about it one time and one of the guys there goes, yeah, I mean, I brought it up one time, but, uh, Henry was like, it only takes good crap beer to bring pudgy white guys with beards over here. I just, I don't really want to be making beer for just certain people. I want to make it for everyone. So like if someone comes in for the first time, has it and enjoys it and they've never had crap beer before, I want one of their jams on. So they say around to have the second to talk to someone. Because mm. what happens if this might be the place where anyone talks to someone, even though they live next to each other? Yeah. They may never talk before. So since I can't change the beer by making crappy PBR or whatever. I love you know, I love how you find an analogy where Paul is reduced to <laughs> bringing in all to experience the joys of craft beer. Yeah. Yeah. 
Who would have guessed? But like, yeah. I'd never thought yeah. of like even making that decision. Like yeah. you, as a person who would never even drink the other stuff, have no idea who shows up in establishments that, should, yeah. that serve the other stuff. But you do notice that there's one that doesn't play like essentially like Mumford and Sons and Imagine Dragons and other angsty things and banjos. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the the decision is deliberate. Yeah. And this this is like I mean uh, this is the act, and you see it in, in a lot of political examples where somebody just doesn't obey the rules that everybody else obeys, whether they believe in the rules or they don't believe in the rules. They just always, you know, you know, sit where they need to sit on the bus. You know, they, they, they don't break the rules. And then the person who just goes, uh, you know, this is no longer meaningful to me, does a simple act in one sense, like a mundane act, which encompasses a truth event that's, that transforms things. And I think Diogenes the Cynic is a good example uh, of someone who... Yes. Oh, do you like oh, that? No, oh. I did, not that I didn't like everything else you said. But that, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I finally said something you like. Yes. <laughs> now, everyone should know that Pete's new book is my favorite he's ever yeah. read. Yeah, I know. I'm, I was right. It's nice to hear that because I'm insecure about the new book, so that was nice. Really? Yeah, you know, uh-huh. just insecure. Uh, but uh, Diogenes the Cynic was someone who, you know, was the smartest guy in town. And, and everybody, I think it was, uh, was it Socrates said about him that he was, or no, Plato said he was like Socrates, a mad Socrates. Um, but, you know, at one stage, I think, uh, you know, Alexander the Great comes up to him and says, uh, I give you, you know, what do you want? You know, what, what do you, you can have anything. Like uh, you're become a court philosopher and, and Diogenes is sunbathing, you know, and, and uh, Diogenes says anything. And he goes, yeah, anything you want. And he says, you know, step, step to the side, you're blocking my son, you know. It was like, this is nothing, you've got nothing to offer me. It's, I'm not even against it. I'm not for it or against it. It's just anything you have to offer me is of, of no value whatsoever. Because if I'm always critiquing wealth, that's often because I'm jealous, like I actually want it. Or if I, if, you know, I'm, or you feel guilty you have too much. Or I have like either way. Much. Yeah, yeah, like look, look at this. I know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that, is like, that is like a $3,000 homebrew system. It's oh, automated. yeah, well. I, well, when you moved in here, what was in this house? Like one sofa, which I just bought from Ikea. It's a nice, nice sofa. Now it's there. I, we, I, I had it for two weeks, and then I had to move it into the garage. But that was so that the dogs didn't destroy it. Yes, that is true. We wanted to preserve You know what? Smell we should have our domestic scratches. disputes in private. Why? And not <laughs> and not in front of the, the vast a lot of people who are watching this, um, but yeah, no. Di- was I saying? Oh yeah, Diogenes. Yes. Oh yeah. If you attack, if you attack um, something, it's off. There's often jealousies. You're often caught up in it. The person who says, "Oh, it's not about numbers," if they're a pastor, but you know that if lots of people came, they'd be like, "Brilliant!" It's not about numbers until you have them, you know. Um, or the person who says, "Oh yeah, I, I those people with loads of money. Look at how they act. They're all idiots." But you know, if they won the lottery. They would like they wouldn't give all the money to the poor. But the true militant is the one who genuinely just goes, oh, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't want that. And, and if and if for some reason they, they picked up a lottery ticket on the street and, and one, they would just be like, yeah, no, let's just give it away. You know, it's the one who is just not caught up in the structure. Um, they've been caught up in something else. Um, all right. So we're going to we're, we're going to I'm glad that our 15 minute introduction r- worked out well. But, yes, <laughs> but, but but Pete and I are trying a new thing where we talk to each other the whole time, yeah. rather than we take turns monologuing. Yeah, so you know you can vote if you've done previous classes or buy the previous classes and watch. You know, and um, right now they can get all like the three previous ones for a very low price. Yeah, although you can find them all for free online. No, you can. There's you can if you but, look hard enough, but you shouldn't. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, but, I'm unemployed. Pete. Like, no. here's the thing: yeah. if if you if you have the lottery ticket right now, then I have an idea. You could buy all the downloads like a hundred times, yeah, and uh, that way, at the, at the end of uh, April, I, I can have health insurance. So, yeah. well, and by the way, this is all important stuff. I mean, I feel like we've actually touched on, um, you know, why why this return to Paul is is important, and uh, you know, so. I'm glad we did this.